Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here on this Sunday where we all sprang ahead. And good for you for doing that. And thank God for cell phones that keep us on track. <laughs> um, <clears throat> have some announcements for today. But I'd like to again welcome you and welcome those who are worshiping with us online today. Do we have any first time guests? Don't be shy. No. Um, today is a super, super special day. We all know how blessed we are to have this incredibly talented choir. Just knocks our socks off. And today we get to show our appreciation to them. So please, choir and congregation, Join us in Parish Hall for a special celebration of our beautiful choir. Linton Bible Studies continue tomorrow <clears throat> with more lessons from Into the Mess and Other Jesus Stories by Debbie Thomas. Check your bulletins for details. It is online on Zoom. It's a great book and Patty's a fabulous leader, so it's a good study. Community Bridges is Mission of the Month for March. Community Bridges delivers essential services, provides equitable access to resources, and advocates for health and dignity across every stage of life. <clears throat> if you would like to support local, and that's the key, this stays in our county, so local children, families, and seniors through Community Bridges, please donate today. Thank you. EMT TED Talk, Small Community, Big Impact, March 17th during fellowship. <clears throat> uh, Tim Gon Goncharoff? Somebody named Tim. <laughs> Explains how a small community can create big changes nationwide. You don't want to miss this one. You'll be surprised at everything our local community has accomplished. And there's a free, after, a free raffle afterwards. More than one eco-friendly item will be raffled off this time. Now listen up. This is really important and it's kind of mandatory. You know, as, as we get. A circle of faith. Retreat at Camp Redwood Glen is March 22nd and 23rd. And we'll hope, we are hoping you will sign up today, which means you're gonna come see me in Parish Hall after we celebrate the beautiful choir. Um, <clears throat> all students receive 100% campership free. Flyers available in the back of your bulletin. Looks like this. So check it out. It's an overnight retreat for everyone, children of all ages, as we like to say. Um, there will also be more information in Parish Hall. If you have any questions, some of us have the answers. So if I don't have the answers, I'll find someone who does. But we want to make this an all-church retreat. At Camp Redwood Glen is lovely. We've had some scouts who have gone up there checked out the accommodations. They're very, very nice. We get meals. It's going to be a fun time. And hopefully if the sky is good, David's going to bring the telescope and we're going to do some stargazing. So it's going to be a great time. Please plan on joining us and come see me in Parish Hall. Oh, please check your bulletin and the weekly e-news for specifics on the upcoming events and other important information what I just went over with you, the Lenten Bible study, the TED Talk, Monday, Thursday's coming up. It's one of our most beautiful services, so don't forget to attend. And then save your stuff for Swap Your Stuff Community Day, <clears throat> sponsored by the Environmental Ministry Team, coming in April. And once again, welcome.
Please join your voices with me in this morning's call to worship from Psalm 65. Happy are those whom you choose and bring near. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house. Please remain standing for our opening hymn. That's later. Should be. Okay. Sorry.
and standing as we open in prayer this morning. Spirit of God, we thank you for all the blessings of life that we celebrate by way of faith in Jesus Christ. As we continue on in the season of Lent, may we find our faith alive and well as we pray for one another, support family and friends, serve our community, care for the earth, and discover at all times your love among us, even as we seek to do now in these moments of worship together. Amen. Good morning. Our responsive reading today is taken from John chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. You can find it in selection in our bulletin. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who sat at the table, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. May God add his blessing to the reading of the word.
Thank you so much, choir, for bringing your voices to worship. And by the way, we're going to be celebrating the work of our choir following the worship service today over in Parish Fellowship Hall. And it's a pleasure to do that and to hear you really lead us and set the tone for our worship this morning. Thank you so much. We come now to a time of morning prayer, and I invite you to join me as we pray. O oh God, you are the one who does not hide from human tragedy and pain and grief. No, to the contrary, you embrace it as if it were your own. And indeed it is. For you've not created us to be alone. You have joined us in our humanity. And your cross bears the witness to that compassion, that sympathy, and the solidarity that you share among us. No crisis, it seems, is too deep for the reach of your love. And we ask that it may touch, even today at this moment, with healing comfort and uplifting strength, the Burklow family, grieving the loss of their dear loved one and our good friend, Doug Burklow. Oh God, as we learn to thank you amid the best moments of our life, may we learn also to discover you in the worst of times. For you do not simply wait to receive our embrace as we search for you in the darkness. Rather, you take the initiative. You are fast to offer your embrace. Even amid that darkness, you enter that darkness that we share and you find us there. You seek us out to share our sorrow, to share the cries of our confusion and pain and grief. But in that embrace, you surround us also in the promise of healing, encircled by the arms of grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, when he prayed, invited us to join him when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May we share the work together as we bring our financial gifts and our offerings now in a spirit of worship. And I invite our ushers, if they would please come now to receive this morning's offering.
blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise God, the source of all our gifts. Praise Jesus Christ, whose power uplifts. Praise the Spirit, Holy Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. O oh, gracious God, for these gifts we bring our thanks today. And to these gifts we bring our desire to serve one another and our community. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. As a general rule, things are pretty peaceful here inside our sanctuary at Congregational Church of Soquel, don't you think? I mean, when we meet on Sunday morning, disruptions are at a minimum. Sure, somebody might uh, experience an uncontrollable episode of coughing or something, excuse themselves and leave the building for a minute. Occasionally, occasionally, one of those smartphones, those cell phones we call them, rings in the middle of worship, usually right in the middle of the morning prayer. <laughs> right on schedule, of course. What well, you know, once in fact somebody's ringtone took us all by surprise, delivering a breathtaking rendition of Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture <laughs> with cannons. I mean, that's very special. Now, over the years, we've had to request an EMT unit or two, which was, of course, unsettling. But by and large, I guess you'd say, the kinds of disruptions that we have here are not anything our faithful ushers cannot handle. However, I have to say, we've never had anyone walk down the center aisle here, ascend the steps, lift up the chancel table, and throw it to the floor. And I'm not suggesting that we do, so don't get any strange <laughs> ideas. But you know what? That's exactly what happens in our scripture chosen for today from John's Gospel, chapter 2. It presents an alarming picture. And if you're not already familiar with this story, you might be surprised to learn that the suspect in question is none other than Jesus himself. So, you know, you may be wondering, how did Jesus, you know, Jesus meek and mild and all that, the Prince of Peace, how did he get so angry? How did he go from turning the other cheek to, well, turning tables over and out from under everyone in the temple. Well, to kind of understand Jesus' actions, it's necessary to get a little behind this scripture, I guess, and discover what was really going on in the religious tradition of Jesus' day and what may have been going on inside the heart of Jesus himself. Now, this story has all the makings of a perfect storm, kind of ready to hit. Now, the setting is Jerusalem. Then, as now, a holy city, yet a temperamental city, and fractured. It was a destination of promise for those like Jesus who were on pilgrimage during the Feast of Passover. The temple itself was crowded and it was a busy place. Sacrificial sacrifices were being made. Money was being exchanged. Roman soldiers stood on every corner and people chafed at the military occupation they represented. Religious zeal, you know, personal piety, political turmoil, you name it. It was all highly concentrated in a solitary time and place, ready in many ways, to erupt in one thunderous moment. 
Now, John places the event near the beginning of Jesus' ministry in his account, but, you know, as the other gospel accounts record, it likely could have taken place near the end, leading directly to Holy Week and Jesus' death. Kind of a litten event then, you might say. However, you know, the author of John has his own reasons for putting this dramatic incident more up front in the story of Jesus' ministry. And he's really less concerned about chronology, far more concerned about matters of faith. He wants to teach us something central, right up front, about the unique quality of Christ's life. And Christ's purpose, his work. Specifically, he hopes to reveal the power, I think, of this event we sometimes call the Incarnation, which as you may recall, the theme of John's Gospel from the outset and throughout, the very essence really of this good news. The Word becomes flesh, we're told in John chapter one. Beyond that, the Word makes a dwelling place among us. That Word is Jesus Christ, the expression of God among us, the dwelling place. Now, most of us like the sound of that word, I think. You know, the words perhaps alone have an impact on you when you hear them. You know, maybe in a peaceful way, I hope. Do you have a favorite dwelling place? A place you like to dwell? Imagine yourself there for a moment. What is it about that place that makes it so special to you? Maybe it's a particular chair. Maybe it's somewhere outside in the natural world. It might not even be a place, you know, per se, but a certain set of conditions that make you peaceful or help you to think. Maybe it's that kind of space. Well, it's not surprising then that God, too, has a favorite dwelling place, apparently. And contrary to popular opinion, it's not really in heaven. It's on earth. Why the earth, you ask? Because it is God's desire. It is God's great desire to dwell with humankind. To share our humanity, and in turn to impart the life of God within us and among us, just as Jesus did. Indeed, God's desire to enter our humanity in the life of Jesus means God becoming one of us. That's right. What is more, this desire on God's part is to be with us, to shape our experience as people of faith by affirming our identity in Jesus Christ. As people, as individuals, but also as his community of faith, the church. But having said that, this is a difficult idea to grasp and, you know, for some, well, difficult to accept and that's understandable. The whole thing defies reason, really. We're taught, of course, most of us to, you know, give attention to reason, the way we think and the way we speak and maybe the way we live. After all, you know, paradox and mystery and all that stuff, those things are, they're hard to understand. And there's nothing reasonable about them. But I'm afraid, my friends, we have a lot of those in the story of Jesus, and there is a good reason. And perhaps that's why, you know, doctrines and creeds and statements of faith, even on their own, commonly fall on deaf ears. Our words fail us, they come to an end. But yet, the mystery and the beauty of God and of faith continues. Well, I'm not here to dispute other people's explanations, but may I offer another way of looking at the subject? 
Rather than some proposition or creed or doctrine or catechism, think instead of the incarnation as something more akin to a strong, rich, and persistent emotion. You know, a desire, a longing on the part of God to be among humankind. A longing to share our life. A longing to walk with us. A longing to suffer with us. And as Holy Week will lead us there, a desire to die with us and for us. But mostly, mostly my friends, it is God's desire to dwell with us in all of those ways. And in that dwelling place, to restore life in ways beyond human imagination. The Gospel of John keeps returning to this desire on the part of God to dwell with us. The strong emotion is something that God is persistent about. The surprising actions of Jesus in the temple bear witness to this divine sense of purpose, I think. The desire that, well, consumes Jesus. As he observed the activities inside the temple, the chosen dwelling place of God, as it was understood, among the people. You know, he may have been reviewing in his own mind that Mosaic law. He was a rabbi. He was a teacher. He, he knew all of that law very well, which included, of course, among it, the Ten Commandments and that particular injunction, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You know, perhaps it was at that moment that Jesus, acting upon the truth of this incarnation, this desire to dwell with human beings, and seeing himself as a new temple wherein God was dwelling upon earth. And at that very moment, he reached out his very human hands beneath the edge of those tables, you know, and with the passion of God resting within him, turned all the ugly contradictions and distorted notions out from under the money changers to reveal a better way. As he would explain, an old dwelling place would be raised and with it an old temple brought down, making way for a, a new one, revealed by the very drama of his life, his death, his resurrection, and by extension, that life, that life abundant that we share and seek to share with others. In effect, Jesus would not simply enter our dwelling place, but would become for us a new place to dwell. Okay, but before we become you know, too comfortable thinking that Jesus' righteous anger is meant for you know, another time and place and somebody else's religion, it's wise to watch our backs, I think. And why is that? Well, because the disorderly conduct Jesus, if you will, is still at large. But this time it is the church, not the temple, in which we find him turning the tables. It's important to understand that Jesus loved the temple as he loved the church. However, as he did then, likewise now, he will not stand by and see it lost in a mass of contradictions and denial because this time, more than ever, his followers, his collective body upon earth is something that he loves. We are the body of Christ now, in our own time and place. So, more than ever, we must affirm our identity 
in him. The people with whom we share a dwelling place, the community that stands as the best evidence of the risen Christ, those who witness to the incarnation of his work and words in the world, his body, the church. Perhaps it's not surprising then that as we read about Jesus cleansing the temple, the results produced by major studies about religion keep coming in. You know, they're probably old news by now. They're simply updated. According to recent Pew studies, more than one in three millennials and those younger, too, refuse to identify with religious tradition of any kind. And what is more, most of these young adults are likely to stay away from the church of this age. Now, it's tempting for those of us in the church to respond in typical fashion. You know, we'll say, well, it's not, it's not really our fault. It's the skeptical media. It's, it's public apathy. It's growing secularism. Or maybe it's just the sum total of all those youth soccer games scheduled on Sunday mornings over the past 30 years or more. Yeah. Well, the reasons are complicated. But if we're honest about the problem, we'll look carefully at ourselves before we start wagging our finger at others. Interviews and popular blog entries remove most of the excuses and they do tell a different story, one we need to know, one we need to be familiar with, one we need to listen to. A growing number of people, especially young adults, see the church as its own worst enemy. A community called to love God and neighbor is increasingly seen not as the solution, but unfortunately, as the problem, guilty, in an increasing way, I think if you read the news of intolerance and exclusion, big on statements of judgment but slow to demonstrate grace, practice compassion, and restore justice to our world. The very justice that Jesus would be informed by as he looked even back to those Hebrew prophets. You know, we live in an age where critical and legitimate questions are being asked by a new generation on the rise. Room for diversity and inclusion surrounding sexuality and gender. The real and present danger of gun violence is on their mind. And the damaging effects of climate change that threaten the earth is part of their future, more than most of ours who are older. Now, these and other concerns are being carried via technology with the velocity of bandwidth never before known. Equipped with hashtags and blogs and chat rooms and filled with words like Me Too and Never Again and Black Lives Matter. And the voices that would silence these changes are becoming increasingly determined and sometimes violent in their exclusionary response. In fact, just recently, the Black Lives Matter mural in downtown Santa Cruz was defaced. Amid all this, the church is being asked to respond. So tell me, as Jesus entered the temple once again, and in effect turned the tables out from under our old, tired, and misguided explanations about things. In many respects, we better hope so. Jesus everywhere, and those of, or Christians everywhere, I should say, and those of every variety, including you and me, are wise to examine our own table and to witness for ourselves what's hit the floor. For it is upon our table that we hope to restore the good news of God's love and we hope people to find it there. A love active, wise, and just. A table meant 
for our time an inclusive space around which we hope to gather, free of hatred and abundant in the love of God that we see demonstrated in the Word who became flesh, the one who dwelt among us. Amen. Join me in singing The Solid Rock. You may also know this hymn by the name My Hope is Built. <laughs>